Um, so I'm neither Protestant nor Roman Catholic. However, I've been watching your debates, and I'm pretty convinced that the early Church did, in fact, believe in the sufficiency and supremacy of Scripture, and that doctrines such as the papacy, the bodily assumption, <clears throat> and the Immaculate Conception were not taught in the early Church. However, I am aware that such doctrines such as, you know, like the perpetual virginity and sinlessness of Mary, although being a development over time, were still believed by Church Fathers who believed in the sufficiency and supremacy of Scripture. So, considering the fact that they never said that those doctrines were deduced independently from Scripture, nor did they ever make reference to another source of revelation, would you say that they deduced it, like, from Scripture by, like, bad exegesis and things like that? Well, sort of like the word faith movement. I mean, uh, things become popular, um, and especially in the early Church, you have a tremendous uh, influence from um, the culture around them. And so, uh, for example, I, I forgot I was going to do a little discussion about this book today. Um, well, I was... Uh, and and one of the the issues uh, that, that a book that I'm talking about here is is dealing with is the influence of Greek thought, uh, various religious movements of that day uh, upon early writers. So we know that Justin Martyr he was influenced by certain forms of Greek philosophy. Tertullian uh, eventually joined um, a ascetic type group called the Montanists. Um, and so we know there are groups like that out there, and sometimes we know exactly what the influences were upon a particular writer. Sometimes we do not. Sometimes we can sort of guess at it. Um, sometimes it's a mixture of things. And so uh, someone can believe in the unique authority of Scripture and still have a very thick lens. So, uh, you know, a lot of people are familiar with the dialogue discussion. Actually, it was an interview uh, that I did with the late Dave Hunt uh, back in the year 2000, as I recall. Um, and my uh, statement to him at one point during our conversation, he had responded to me about something about John chapter 6. And instead of giving me an exegetical response, something that was based upon the text, um, he gave me something that really wasn't connected to the test text at all. And my response to him was, Dave, that's just your traditions. And his response to me was, James, I have no traditions. <laughs> now, when someone says they have no traditions, what that means is their traditions have them completely under their control. They're not even aware that they're there, and therefore they cannot test them. They cannot look at them. And so uh, we have the advantage in, in our day with as much communication as we have to have others challenge us when we give evidence that our traditions are getting in the way of our exegesis of Scripture. Um, you didn't have quite as much of that opportunity in, in the ancient world, um, and you didn't have quite the, you know, the library of sound books, and especially in the early Church, um, you have people writing who actually have a limited canon of the New Testament. They don't even have all the New Testament books as, as yet that they're even familiar with. And so uh, there's all sorts of reasons uh, why uh, someone might come to a conclusion. For example, you have the rise in the middle of the second century and, and really flowering by the middle of the third century of monasticism, uh, the Desert Fathers in Egypt and places like that, uh, all the way up into the area regions around Caesarea, the, the, the Pillar Saints and, and the whole development of a monastic movement. And uh, that monastic movement was originated from a lot of extra-biblical, extra-Christian sources. And so once someone who has those uh, concepts in mind encounters the Christian scriptures, um, unless there is a, you know, a, a real opportunity for being pushed to have balance and to filter and to examine all those presuppositions, you end up with some weird stuff. I mean, I mean, seriously, if you know what one of the pillar saints were, um, then you know these were people that built up these pillars and, and lived on the tops of these pillars. And some would get so tall, they'd have to have disciples that would, that would climb up these pillars and bring them food and take their waist down. Um, and you go, what 
how do you get that from a balanced reading of the New Testament, where we're supposed to be going out into the world, and we're supposed to be salt and light, and it, how do you get that? Well, you get that by, by imbalanced, uh, an imbalanced understanding of certain texts that become all, the all-important lens through which everything else is seen. And so, you know, um, am I saying that every single one of those people wasn't saved or something? No, I mean, it's really weird to me. Um, right, right. But I think, I think you know, uh, they may well have been Christians who, once they got to heaven, God's like, dude, you know what you could have done during that time? I mean, come on, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, um, it, it really... Church history does give us the opportunity. The, the church ends up struggling with things, and issues come up, and clarification takes place as, as a result. And so uh, the early church had to struggle with Christological issues, the nature of Christ, uh, Apollinarianism, uh, all the rest of that type of stuff. And as I've pointed out many times, didn't really go nearly as in-depth in other areas, such as for example, eschatology or the atonement or things like that. And then up, up pops a, a great controversy, Pelagianism, which refocuses attention and causes, uh, you know, a major works to be written and, and things like that. And frequently what it is, is it's a pendulum swing. So all of a sudden this big controversy comes up, you get a pendulum swing and it may go past a biblical center point to something to the other extreme and but pendulums swing back and eventually you have you have something hopefully more toward the middle um however what you have in history is a situation where uh external tradition becomes normative uh more and more over time um and that's why for example unlike some of my baptist forebears um I can look at the medieval period and I can see Christians in the medieval period. Not everybody. There's a tremendous amount of mm -hmm. nominalism, tremendous amount of nominalism, but there are still Christians there. Uh, it, the church didn't cease to exist. It's, it's not, you know, we're not Joseph Smith and oh, now right. it's 1830 all as well. Um, and so uh, there, it, it does require a, a level of um, grace, I guess, to look back and to uh, see these individuals and to see what might have influenced them. That helps me to see what might influence me. There are controversies mm -hmm. that I could think are very, very important that end up, you know, pushing me one direction or another. Um, but I'm just thankful that God has always had his people, and I am thankful that each generation has had the Word of God. It's been preserved for us. Uh, it remains that strong bulwark. But when I, if you, if, if you, it sounds like you're doing the reading anyways, just look at the second Nicene Council, 8th century, um, and look at the argumentation that was used by the second Nicene Council, long after the, after the original Nicene Council in 325. Um, it was used by uh, the second Nicene Council to substantiate the veneration of saints and images compare the biblical, the, the level of biblical literacy and argumentation there 400 years after uh, 325, and you'll be, I think, stunned uh, because there's, <laughs> there's, there's a huge change. There's a huge change. So yeah, uh, there's um, uh, once, especially when it comes to, for example, something like celibacy, Mary, the things that were deeply associated with the monks, Hey, the monasteries and the monks became the primary theological faculty of the church, shall we say. And so what's really important to them becomes really important during that time period. And so the, the exaltation of Mary, especially such things. Now, so I'll make one exception there, even though it was foundational. The perpetual virginity of Mary is first found in clearly Gnostic sources. Right. Um, and so, yeah, that's a, that's a real, to me, a clear example of where you have an external consideration that ends up, in my opinion, when I read even modern Roman Catholic writers attempting to defend that over against the natural uh, language of the New Testament about brothers and sisters, um, 
even to the point where, in essence, you I would argue very strongly that the orthodox understanding of the perpetual virginity of Mary, since it involves the maintenance of Mary's physical virginity, um, fundamentally means Jesus beamed out of Mary. There was no natural birth. I was listening. I was listening. What was I listening? Oh, this morning. I went on a walk this morning. And I was looking for material on a specific, really, really esoteric subject. And I had done a search on, uh, on the podcast app on, on Apple. And I start, end up, end up listening to this Roman Catholic priest who was supposed to be talking about the subject that I wanted him to get to. He never got around to it. But one of the things that he somehow got onto was the perpetual Virginia Mary and the fact there was no afterbirth. There was no normal, any of the normal associated things with, with, with birth. And so here's a guy. He was talking about Pope Francis, so it's been within the past couple of years, and it's still the same, no natural birth of Jesus. So, I mean, that I would think that most people would recognize that fundamentally attacks the incarnation, the reality of the, of the human nature of Jesus. But that's put off to the side because we need to have Mary have this particular set of attributes. So there's, there's a good example where... Uh, you know, Jerome is going to uh, engage in good exegesis of many passages of Scripture. He's very insightful. He knows a lot about the original languages and backgrounds and stuff like that. But when it comes to that, since he's in a monastery, and since there are certain things that are vitally important in the tradition that he is now living in, you can see how his exegesis completely changes once he encounters these types of things. So, it helps us to see when that happens today. Uh, I mean, there are great brothers and great interpreters, and then all of a sudden they'll say something, and I just go, huh? Where did that come from? Um, and it's it's because of some quirk in their past. It's some something that they experienced and still happens, and it probably happens to me, and the problem is you generally don't recognize it when it happens to you. But church history helps you to be looking for it.